Welcome everyone on behalf of the CERTL Network to today's event on inclusive teaching in engineering and technology. I see that we've got a small group in the room today, so I look forward to everyone interacting throughout the session today, and I'm sure we will have more people joining us in these next few minutes. Since we do have a full panel of five speakers, um, I want to make sure we get started on time. And before I hand things off to our moderator for today, Anusha Rao, um, to introduce our speakers, I just want to welcome everyone who's here on behalf of the CERTL Network. If you are new to CERTL, we are the Center for the Integration of Research, Teaching, and Learning, and we're a network of universities around the U.S. and Canada working to uh, advanced evidence-based inclusive STEM teaching approaches so that uh, grad students and postdocs in STEM fields today can become excellent teachers in their future. Um, you can learn more about what we do on our website. And we also would like to invite you to attend uh, additional events in this series later this month and early next month. Next week, we will be hosting an event on inclusive teaching in math and informatics. And on Wednesday, May 2nd, we will be wrapping up the series with an event focusing on talking about inclusive learning communities, inclusive teaching learning communities. And I think regardless of your discipline, that final event in the series will certainly have something of relevance for everyone here today. Um, I will turn things over to our moderator at this point, Anusha Rao. While she introduces herself and the speakers, I would love it if the folks who are in the room could introduce themselves in the chat window. Let us know who you are and where you're joining us from today. Thank you, Kate. And good afternoon, everybody. I'm Anusha Rao. I'm the Assistant Director at the Center for Teaching and Learning at IUPUI. IUPUI stands for Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. Um, it's a, a campus that's part of the Indiana University, but grants degrees from Indiana University and Purdue University, just to clarify the acronym. Um, so jo thank you all for joining us for this session, which is the second of our sort of cast series on inclusive teaching in the STEM disciplines. And today we're particularly looking at inclusive teaching um, in engineering and technology disciplines. So the format would be a panel discussion, and we invite our participants to use the whiteboard, use the chat box to share their comments and questions at all points throughout the session. We do have specific slides where we will uh, give opportunities for more such conversations. Uh, let me quickly introduce our panel today. Um, we have faculty, future faculty, graduate students, and undergraduate students from Indiana University, from IUPUI, and from Purdue University. Uh, Ms. Paula Angarita, she is a undergraduate student in biomedical engineering from IUPUI and is also a math major from Marian University. Ms. Kanakwan Bishop, also known as Jiffy Bishop, is an undergraduate student at IUPUI in biomedical engineering. Mr. James Hawley, Jr. is a doctoral candidate at Purdue University in engineering education. And then we have our faculty from uh, Purdue University, Professor Allison Godwin, who is an assistant professor in engineering education. And last but not least, Professor Patrick G, who is a lecturer in freshman engineering at IUPUI, and he is also the director of minority engineering uh, advancement program here at IUPUI. I also have a co-facilitator for this panel discussion, and I will let Kathleen introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name is Catlin Martin. I'm the uh, graduate teaching assistant here with CERTL. Um, I work at the Center for Teaching and Learning at IUPUI. Uh, currently, I'm a master's student um, in the counseling counselor education program, um, going to be a school counselor. Thank you, Catlin. And welcome to all of our panelists and welcome to all of our uh, participants today. So let's get started with our um, session. So the first thing we wanted to do was to um, 
do a quick poll. I know you all introduced yourself on the chat window and provided some information as to where you're from and what are your disciplines. Uh, so at this point, we would like to get a sense of um, are you an undergraduate student, a graduate student, a postdoc, or a faculty administrator, or any other roles in academia? So um, you can use the, um, the poll option on Blackboard to select A, B, C, D, or E. You should see a little letter A at the top of the, um, the participant screen. Anusha, your microphone is off. We're not hearing you right now. Thank you, Kate. So uh, we do have a lot of graduate students, about nine graduate students, five um, faculty or administrators. Um, we do have um, a few undergraduate students and postdoc fellows. So welcome one and all. We do have another poll for you. And this is more to do with the disciplines that you are from. Even though this session is on engineering and um, technology, we we'll definitely welcome participants from other disciplines too. So we wanted to get a sense of what disciplines are our attendees from today. So the majority of our attendees are from engineering. We have a couple from technology um, and a good number of uh, folks from STEM disciplines. So we're really have, glad to have you here, even though this is a session for exploring diversity and engineering and technology. Please feel free to share your um, thoughts and comments and questions in terms of strategies that you've seen enacted in your own discipline to bring about equity and, um, and inclusion within your own discipline. So thank you all for joining us once again today. So let's move on to the, to the actual panel discussion. Uh, before we get started with having our panelists talk a little bit about their experiences, and this is broadly in research, teaching, and learning, I wanted to share this. Um, quote that I found in a very recent um, publication of the Jur Journal of Engineering Education. Dr. Alice Polly is an associate professor of engineering education at Purdue University, and she had written up a, a guest editorial uh, in the JEE, uh, in a recent issue of JEE, and I'll read this quote out right out of her um, editorial. I think the engineering education research community could use this idea. If our desired state is one where the demographics of our profession reflect those of the general population of where we live, what would we need to make this the default position? In other words, what if we shift the burden of proof from the people advocating for the value of diversity to those supporting the status quo or asking the latter group to justify the white male state of their research? So off the face of it, this comment can sound very challenging and aggressive, but if you go on to read through the rest of the editorial, she comes up with some really great suggestions for us to think about our research, about our teaching, and instead of trying to um, say that we need to make a case for diversity, why not make that the default? And those, even if it's a minority, as to who do not support this requirement directly, if they could explain as to why they feel that they have to use populations or demographics which really show the dominant white male within the engineering uh, disciplines, engineering and technology disciplines. So I just wanted to leave this out there and we welcome additional questions and comments based on this, um, this interesting thought that Alice had uh, shared in this editorial. And keeping that in mind, we'll move on to our first question for the afternoon. And we start off with a really broad question here, which kind of relates to some of the thoughts that Alice had shared in the editorial. The graph that you see here is actually pulled from a recent report from NSF um, on science and engineering 
um, science and engineering and technology fields and what is the, the demographics, what is the, um, the number of women, um, minor underrepresented minorities and disabled people within these um, disciplines both in, in academia and in the industry. And as you can see, the numbers are kind of talking about what Alice was talking about in her editorial. So what we have here for our for our panelists is how do learner and instructor identities in engineering classrooms and courses inform current engineering education reality? And James had volunteered to start off this discussion, so I'm going to pass the mic over to James now. All right, hello everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to kick off the uh, discussion and I'll jump right in. Um, so looking at the graph, I think these are one of the things talking about diversity and inclusion um, that in shows an impact in how instructor identities and classroom identity and course and learners, other learners and instructors impact the classroom. And, and I think most of the time we think about diversity, it's usually as it's shown on the graph in regards to race or ethnicity and gender. And those identities are part of us, but not necessarily all of us. And also they influence cultural ways that we act and behave. Um, and then our other cultures influence that as well. And so I think the first thing um, I feel like is obvious is that our identities, whether it's learners or teachers or instructors, shape the context and the climate of the learning environment. Um, and so one of those ways is from a teacher instructor standpoint is you get to determine with the power that you have in shaping the, the course, the materials that are used. Um, and so certain books have certain flavors or certain dynamics that they address or don't address. Um, certain books highlight certain ways of thinking about problems in the field. And so you get to determine that as well as you get to determine the style and pedagogical uh, approach. Um, and generally in engineering, the, the, there's a thought that engineering is objective, is just valid truth, and that those other social dynamics don't really play into our materials. We just choose the best material, right? Or it doesn't play into pedagogy, like this is the best way of doing things, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, and so I think part of the way is shaping this context and climate of the classroom. Another uh, dynamic that matters is that, uh, and as you can see with the low representation of black people or Hispanic men and women, like minority perspectives, and whether that is ethnic minorities, racial ethnic minorities, or whether that's um, your perspective, the way that you think and approach things, you're the minority in that way, it's easy to be, be ignored. So minority perspectives also get ignored in the classroom, especially when you're in classrooms at large universities, and they're very big, um, that you know, the dominant group just gets to determine who defines problems and how they are addressed. So some people, based on their identity, their cultural, background and things like that, um, the way they approach problems is very different. And with that, assimilation or coping becomes safe in the classroom. So you might disagree, you might have a different way of doing things, but you could be excluded from the classroom, excluded from participation from your ideas, or you can be physically excluded from the classroom. And so that can deal with self-confidence, psychological stress, and those type of dynamics. Um, and then lastly, because of these things, we miss out on rich and complex learning experiences. Um, and, and just learner formation. So this idea that Dr. Pauly talked about with the white male dynamic or perspective is dominant, it expands the culture and society and how engineers do their profession. Um, the, the problems that are sought out, the grand challenges, the, the, the way that the culture is shaped in the broader landscape is from a, a, a dynamic of whiteness and the white male structure. So those are just a few quick thoughts I have. Thank you for sharing that, James. Um, I think we have next Allison. Yeah, so thanks, James. I, I think I would echo a lot of the same points that you made about um, how instructor and student identities play out in the classroom. I think in the in the teaching context, you know, I think we see real differences based on the types of pedagogies used on how learner identities are incorporated into the classroom. So I think of classes where I'd like to see more being done uh, along these lines of culturally relevant pedagogy where students' backgrounds and interests are embedded into how class is structured and that there's individual uh, approaches to supporting students on those different backgrounds. 
But what I think the reality is in a lot of the classrooms I see is it's the very traditional chalk talk lecture, or these days we're using um, you know, whiteboards or um, even on dot cams. But it's very similar to the way engineering has been taught for hundreds of years. And I think that student identities are often ignored in those particular spaces. And I appreciate the fact that you're talking and bringing forward the idea of multiple identities, uh, which is also really salient in my own research, um, that we aren't just one of the traditionally underrepresented demographic categories that we talk about, like women or race, ethnicity, um, or disability, or first generation college students. We're much more of the amalgamation and multiple layering of all of those things in the classroom. And so I feel like when we look at some of these things um, from what exists, we see that these often aren't discussed. And the, the book is the book, like you said, and the, the lecture is the way it's presented based on the decisions of the faculty member who's in the room. And I'd love to see us start to push against that um, in the ways that we think about how we construct a classroom for who is there and who is involved. Um, I think the reality is that we have students who walk in the door who represent the pie chart we see here that um, look a certain way and think a certain way. And I think that brings up questions about earlier interventions of who, who is it comes to engineering and how we, we broaden that participation earlier. Um, when it comes to research, I think there is a there has been a shift to, to focus on diversity, although we've seen um, some recent, um, I would say, backlash in the community and um, mostly from people outside who don't understand the importance of some of this work. I think that's where the editorial from um, Dr. Alice Pauley came from, and, and we've recently seen support from the American Society for Engineering Education releasing a diversity uh, support statement for its researchers. But I think one of the interesting things that we've seen is that folks who do this work often focus on the student identities that are in the classroom. And I've seen fewer studies of re and research that look at um, the instructor identities in the classroom and how that shapes the decisions. And um, one person who's doing really incredible work in this space is Dr. Adalis Villanueva, who's looking at um, what she's terming the hidden curriculum, which I think is really fascinating to think about. Uh, what are the hidden facets that aren't explicit in the classroom that students either buy into because they're the norms or find challenges with in the inclusion space because they're shaped by decisions that um, are made by faculty? And so, um, you know, I think making those things that are hidden and accepted as norms and that students should just get um, more explicit would be a way to start to make uh, engineering education more inclusive. Um, I think one of the other challenges is beyond just this idea of being ignored, the other polar opposite that students um, who are underrepresented, especially demographically and, and on the visual space of race and gender and ethnicity space, is that um, in walking in the room, if they are one of the only ones in the classroom where they're being asked to speak for all students when um, their opinion is being requested. I think that's the other challenge of, of trying to make these classrooms more inclusive is if you either, I think the polar, two polar opposites that are, are negative spaces are, are being ignored completely in this white male dominated culture that, that you spoke about, but also the far opposite piece of that as well, that um, asking a student to speak for all of women who are all of people of color can be incredibly problematic even when you're trying to make an inclusive space. Thanks for sharing those great ideas, Alison. And um, we have also have Patrick who would like to share his thoughts on this particular question. We can think about that instructor identity and then we've heard with both those great comments, great set of comments, inclusivity. And that other I could be intentional. We really have to be intentional uh, in the classroom. Uh, one thought is the chart. It does give us that uh, for the African-American male, if we said 5%. Um, from my viewpoint, I work with an, a pre-college program. And so in the pre-college program, we seek out underrepresented students. So our percentage is the flip. We have 95% uh, representation, whereas our chart says 5%. So we want to just mention if we were intentional, we, those students are there. Once we get in the classroom, what can we do to be intentional? Uh, I've had um, assignments where 
I've used examples from international representations, uh, different names. Um, again, we, we had uh, some great comments here and to really put into a nutshell uh, one idea, I had gone to a conference and someone was really talking about even looking at the roster, seeing the names, and do, do we sometimes perhaps not call on a name because it's challenging to pronounce or do we not call on a student because that student's a female versus an African American student versus a, another ethnicity. Um, and so that nutshell, I wanted to talk about this student, Orangelo, Orangelo. And so even out in our audience, people are thinking, oh, Orangelo, what, well, I mean, where does that student come from? Is that ethnic? ethnic? Um, but if we think about changing our viewpoint, what about orange jello? Orangelo, orange jello. So I'll pause there. Thank you for that very interesting uh, point, Patrick. So we, so all of our panelists here have raised some really interesting questions in terms of how we can reshape the conversation in terms of intersectionality of identities that James was talking about, a sense of token effect that Allison was talking about, um, in the sense where you know one particular person from that uh, background is has to represent the entire uh, group of people from that background or is supposed to say that that particular pedagogy works for them or not on the basis of the particular background that they come from and making culturally relevant uh, or choosing culturally relevant pedagogies is also important. So um, the next question that we have is kind of gets a little bit more into a specific focus of um, self-efficacy of engineering students, which is very closely related to their identities. Self-efficacy is nothing but your um, the amount of uh, confidence or the belief that you have in yourself that you would be able to perform a task very well. So a strong having a strong self-efficacy would obviously be linked to strong student success in engineering and in other disciplines. So we looked at what the reality of the, the current engineering education scenario is. So how can engineering and technology faculty nurture student self-efficacy, particularly female students who are underrepresented in these fields? So this is a, a whiteboard question. So at this point, we definitely welcome comments and questions from participants. So feel free to use the whiteboard option to put in your questions and comments on this, on this question or even on uh, the other question that we've heard about. Um, and Jiffy has volunteered to um, start off the conversation on this question. So I'll um, let Jiffy take over from here. Um, uh, thank you, Anusha, for that introduction. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm an undergraduate student um, at IUPY in biomedical engineering. Um, I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, um, but then I moved up here. So. Aside from me being a student, um, I take a really active role in our School of Engineering um, Women in Engineering program. So we have um, we have some high school camps that we put on for young girls. We have um, we have meetings with employers that talk about inclusivity of especially female students. Um, so just so everyone knows a little bit about me, I'm very active in um, in kind of the female and engineering. Um, inclusion movement on our campus. Um, I think that's really important. Um, not only, you know, I serve as a mentor um, for our undergraduate female engineering students because we've, as the years have gone by, we've kind of noticed that within our school, um, the female, um, I wouldn't say dropout rate, but you know, the, the number of females who tend to leave the engineering school as a whole is a lot higher than men. And one day I was really just trying to understand why. Um, and I think, you know, in general, obviously everyone knows that women are underrepresented in the engineering field. And I think that starts with exposure. I think, you know, um, based on my own experience, you know, I wasn't exposed to engineering until um, probably my senior year of high school. Um, you know, children, they're brought around, you know, law or doctors or, 
they they know of those careers ahead of time. But there's not a lot of education about engineering or technology fields until you get to that, you know, late adolescent years. So I think by that point, it's kind of hard for people to choose engineering when they haven't heard much about it yet. Um, most of the females that I know of in um, in the engineering programs, their their dads were engineers or their uncles were engineers. They they had a family member, a male family member, who kind of got them into the field, but there wasn't a lot of women who just kind of naturally went into it. And so, as a school or you know in the women's engineering network or in the society of women engineers, we try to build a network of successful women engineers and expose young girls to that early. So all the way from high school age to college age, that's what um, so we'll try to expose themselves to. And we try to show them powerful, respected women ex exceeding in these roles. And, and that's how we build to kind of, you know, up their motivation and, and expand they're, they're thinking of what an engineer actually does. Um, in my experience, you know, the, the engineering mentors and um, people out into the industry who come to our events, they are kind of at the top of their fields. And I think that's really, really important for women who are studying engineering in a sea of men. Um, I think that's really important for us to see is that there are you know, women in really powerful roles who got there not just playing the men's game, but also using their own attributes. Um, you know, they are great communicators. They're great relationship builders. I think that's really important to include um, not only in the curriculum, but just kind of talking about any, any kind of um, self-motivation for success, not just in school, but later on in life. Um, so I'm going to pause this right here and um, see if you guys have any more questions for me at, from, you know, a student standpoint, from, from a standpoint of um, a female student who actively works towards that inclusivity. Thank you for sharing that, Jiffy. At this point, I'd like to welcome um, folks from the audience and also the other panelists. If they would like to share um, any additional thoughts, uh, you can feel free to use the raise hand. We have Allison. Allison, please go ahead. Sure. So um, I think this is a. I think that was a really great discussion, and I really appreciate the the work you're doing on your campus and the the perspectives you're bringing into the the panel. I think one of the other things. From the research that's, that's a is challenging is, is maybe threefold, and and one is the fact that uh, when we start to disaggregate, uh, looking at self-efficacy by other identities like uh, race, ethnicity, or first-generation college student status, we start to see differences among students. And so, um, while I think it starts to help us put a finger on an issue when we start saying women um, have low self-efficacy, that those um, challenges may look different across different groups. And so. Um, my question then is like, how do I identify who who that might be at risk um, in this feeling that less confident in their abilities to succeed on task? And what are the kinds of interventions that can be done to support these students in engineering? And then I think that the, the last thing I'd say is that um, from work on identity and in some of our own models when we look at engineering identity and how students see themselves as engineers, these beliefs about ability to succeed are incredibly important. But one of the other really important things that I think place to some of the actions we can take is students' feelings of recognition by others. And so how do we as teachers and instructors and TAs in the classroom start to give students who may not be traditionally um, the smart student in class or the one that's always called on opportunities for recognition that they are the kinds of people who can engage in engineering to start to feed into how students internalize those beliefs and build self-efficacy. Thank you, Allison. We it looks like Paula and Patrick would also like to share their thoughts. Paula, hi. Um, thank you, Anisha, for introducing me. I'm Paula Angarita. I'm a first year, uh, first generation uh, international student doing engineering. Um, 
as an international student coming from a country where um, women is not very um, broad to the engineering program, um, here in um, IUPUI and Mary University, I had the opportunity to uh, have mentors who actually um, increased my passion for engineering because I knew I liked science and I liked physics, chemistry. I knew that this is my my good side. This is where I'm good at it. Um, when I came to the United States the first time, um, my desire was like to be a civil engineer and these women at my high school was like, no, you cannot do it because you are an international student, your English is not very good, um, you are not prepared to be a good engineer. So besides this woman told me that I cannot be an engineer, and but I applied to schools, colleges, um, I applied with a different major because um, I didn't know anything about the college system in the United States. I was brand new, um, international student, so when I applied for college, um, I applied to different major. When I got to college, um, I told this story to my mentor at that moment that is not really part of the engineering program. And I told her that I had good grades, I, um, I'm good at math, and I wanted to try to be in an engineering program. So this mentor contacted um, the Department of Mathematics in Mary University. They gave, some, they gave me some tests to, like, to take, and they, they incentivated me to go and pursue my engineering program. So um, that's the reason why I'm doing engineering right now. So definitely, yes, um, my mentors back in, in Marion, and also my professor who I'm working with right now, he always is making me to pursue more uh, after graduation, pursue a PhD or a master if you want. Uh, he's always there to show me support. Um, also because he knows that I'm part of those minority where women don't really like do engineering. Thank you, Paula, for sharing that inspiring um, experience. Uh, I think Patrick is next in line. Patrick, please go ahead. And very quickly, uh, one of the questions came up about support groups, and then also it was mentioned how do we identify areas to support that self-efficacy. And I, in the notes, I was just writing uh, the chance to give a plug to groups like Society of Women Engineers, uh, student organizations, National Society of Black Engineers as a student organization, and Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. Those are most popular, but there's others for architecture, other groups, but these student orgs really give support to raise that level of self-efficacy. Thank you, Patrick. Jiffy? Hello? Hello. Uh, yeah, so I, I kind of wanted to expand on that. Um, I'm answering the question on the whiteboard. Do you think participating in organizations that support women or minorities in engineering are helpful for persistence and degree completion? Um, in my experience, I would say absolutely. I think um, there is a true value to joining an organization that that helps to promote that success. Um, you know, based on my own experience, my first year of college was a really hard adjustment. Um, being, you know, one of the only girls in a class of 40 men or um, just any any kind of environment at all where you don't necessarily feel extremely comfortable building a niche right away, um, it's it's hard to think that you can persist when you don't have some external motivator kind of letting you know, hey, we can all do this, here are the outcomes, you know, you're kind of stuck in the now and the the, the, str the struggles that you're currently dealing with without someone painting you kind of the bigger picture. Whereas, you know, with my work in the, um, in the uh, women's engineering network or the Society of Women Engineers, you know, a full week's worth of um, just really hard exams or tests can kind of be erased out of my mind if I go to a meeting where I talk to an engineer at, you know, Lilly or at Roche. Um, just building that network really, really helps me to see the bigger picture 
and it kind of calms me down about the the immediate struggles that any student would have to go to. Um, so I think I think it's it's good for um, kind of taking you out of your your personal element at the moment and and exposing you to here's what could be if you just stick with it if you just um, you know work through the hard times. I think that's the key is being exposed to people who have gone what you've gone through and kind of seeing that they're better off for it. Um, and then I think I'm answering um, the question, can you reflect on experiences you've had in class or lab where you felt faculty were invested in your success, self-efficacy? What did they do that worked? Um, so I, I'm a very ambitious person. Uh, I applied I do a lot of internships, a lot of research positions. Um, you know, I attend a lot of the conferences where I'm exposed to different grad programs. So I think um, as a student, it's hard to come to faculty. But um, for me, it's, it's not really an issue. So I go to faculty and kind of share with them my personal questions about um, any kind of future paths. So I'm, I'm pretty um, friendly or close to a few of my professors who have kind of been with me through the entire, you know, applying to an internship, interviewing for that internship, getting the internship, and what comes after. I think um, just building that personal relationship is there, um, is you know, the number one key. But I, but I also understand that not every student is comfortable going to a faculty member and asking those kinds of questions. Um, so I mean, in my, in my our department, we have a class completely dedicated to um, the future, or um, we, we just call it our seminar class where we have, not only do we have industry speakers or research speakers who come in every week and talk to us about their job or the research that they're doing, but it's also a class that um, helps us build our resume and helps us with interviewing um, processes. It's it's a whole class dedicated to structuring, okay, what are we going to do after we graduate? And, um, and some students, you know, think it's useless or they, you know, it's every student makes of it what they want. Um, I personally get a lot out of that class because I'm able to talk to people in the industry working or people in grad, grad school. Um, and I think, you know, having a class dedicated to that is really, really important. And it, it allows students to think a lot more ahead of time. Um, I think we're so used to kind of focusing on that immediate next thing. So we're focused on, you know, next week's quiz or next month's exam or the project that's due that we kind of stop to think about the big pictures. Oh, what are we doing? What am I going to be doing in five years? So I think there's having a particular class dedicated to making us research the possible career opportunities and um, the different companies that you could apply to. I think that's really helpful. And, and the faculty um, that teaches that class for me is the faculty that I go to about um, you know my personal successes. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but um, you know, in my in my experience, I we have a particular class completely dedicated to our future success. Thank you for sharing that, Jiffy. So this is uh, this is very very helpful information for folks um, who are you know working with curriculum design, program planning. That's a very very helpful um, piece of information for us to think about as faculty when we design our curriculum, when we design or when we choose the pedagogies that we want to, um, you know, utilize in our classroom. And I also wanted to just um, mention this a strategy here that was pointed. I'm going to try to use this. If you should see the little star that I put here, the light bulb could be useful for instructors to normalize and discuss struggle. For example, in these majors, everyone struggles. So that could also be another strategy. So we've, we've heard some really, really great um, strategies and reflect, uh, and experiences here. And shifting gears slightly and moving on to um, a little bit of a different question with what happens after the class is taught. So 
the next question we had was student evaluations. And this is gender bias in student evaluations is not something that has just been researched in engineering. So we've just pulled up a, an article here. This is from a, a recent IEEE publication in 2017, which looked at gender biases in uh, computer science evaluations and environmental engineering evaluations. And obviously, they found that engineering, environmental engineering, the, the female instructors were rated poorly on several um, criteria compared to the male instructors. And the graph on the uh, right side is actually a tool that Kathleen had found. Um, this was created by Ben Schmidt from Northeastern University. He's an assistant professor there. And um, he actually did some data mining with the Rate My Professors. Um, Rate My Professor has a lot of other kinds of critique going on, so take this data with a pinch of salt. Um, where he tried to compare how uh, male and female instructors were um, rated and look, using a keyword search. And as you can see, pretty much for all of the, um, the uh, disciplines, the female instructors did have a lower um, count on this particular word funny. So if you actually, we will share this resource if you actually go in and put in a different word like caring, considerate, competent, then you can see how male and female instructors have been rated. So our question to our panelists was, um, how do engineering and technology combat gender bias? And um, Allison had volunteered to um, answer this question or get this conversation started. Yeah, so as, a, as an instructor in engineering classrooms, this is always something um, that sits in the back of my mind. Um, I think as, as Anusha really well pointed out that there's not a lot of research on engineering specifically, but when we look at some of the larger bodies of literature, we see kind of two big things. And one is that um, overall, that teaching evaluations um, have a small amount of bias, but they do have, a, have some bias. And so that argument's been used in the past, especially from very large meta-analyses to kind of justify the continued use of these um, evaluations. And they tend to affect um, things like promotion and tenure processes and, and annual evaluations and may even more so affect um, those kinds of evaluations for teaching focused faculty. And um, I think one of the challenges there is even though the bias is, is small and some might argue that um, that's not a problem, that the accrual of these minor biases over time can really start to affect the, someone's career and their pathway. And so I think it's really important that we start to, to ask these kinds of questions about um, the tools we're using to assess faculty and are those tools fair, which is a key component of validity. Um, I, I am familiar with the study on um, the words in Rate My Professor, and while there are limitations that these are um, Rate My Professor accounts and not teaching evaluations that are collected by universities, this is data that are publicly available. And I think when you start to look through the literature and the tool, one of the things that you'll see that is I think most concerning to me is that um, the words used to describe male faculty who are rated highly are things like funny and confident and organized. And the things that are used to describe female faculty that are highly rated are things like caring, nurturing, mentor, kind. And those particular differences in the expectations of students and how they're evaluating faculty based on gender um, creates a different kind of burden in the classroom for faculty to earn high teaching scores and to be rated as highly effective teachers. And so you can imagine in a classroom of 250 students, or in my case I teach 120 students at a time, um, it's a lot easier to walk into a room and be organized and confident and funny than to, t to convince uh, 120 students that I care. And I do care, and I would say that the, the faculty who our male faculty probably care too, especially if they're being rated as good teachers, but the differential criteria by which students start to rate professors I think is where the problem sits really and we need to, we need to be asking those questions. And so in the question of, of how do we start to combat this bias or what do we do, I think the first thing is to acknowledge that traditional teaching scores and the weight, at least in my context in an engineering college with quantitatively focused folks, is that those ratings are, are inval in, infallible and that they're a good tool to use to measure these. And while they may be the tool we have, I, I question whether they are the best tool. And so are there more holistic ways of evaluating um, faculty that are broader in um, 
peer evaluations or other, other mechanisms of collecting different kinds of assessments that don't have the same kinds of documented biases, even though they're small biases that um, when we see, and, and often those are exacerbated in STEM disciplines. So I guess this is particularly salient in the context we have here. And the last thing I'll say um, is that I don't think these things start in the university level. So there's actually um, research looking at high school teachers in STEM subjects, so uh, physics, chemistry, biology, and looking at um, the ratings of students on male and female teachers in those contexts. And um, what's interesting is that female teachers are rated lower. And in looking at those, they're rated lower not only um, by male students, but also by female students. So it's, it's one of those things I think that goes back to um, gender stereotypes that are ingrained in our culture and society and the biases we bring into the classroom of our expectations for the roles particular groups play and um, how they convey knowledge in the classroom. Thank you, Alison. So we definitely have a lot of work to do. <laughs> so um, just in the interest of time, I want to make sure that we also address one more um, rather broad question which really gets into the strategies. Because one of the things that comes up in a lot of these panel discussions is, OK, here is the status. Here is what, what the problems are. This is what the literature says. What now? What do we do next? So this is a question that we wanted to um, kind of open it up to our panelists and our participants. We'll start with the panelists first. And again, participants and panelists, please feel free to use the whiteboard really talking about the research in the field of engineering education, how is it considered diversity and inclusion? And this goes, this is a very, very broad question. This is something that our panelists have also mentioned to us. So feel free to address it in any specific way you would like to. And how can faculty translate these research findings uh, into inclusive classroom practices? So really thinking about strategies. And I know Patrick has given us a few strategies, and so have other panelists. So this is this slide is something that, uh, or this question is something that we would like to focus on, or really the strategies that folks can, um, so the research uh, faculty, the, the teaching faculty, the graduate students, TAs, and the undergrads. So what are some strategies to make or to create inclusive classroom practices? Um, and we have James, who's volunteered to start off this conversation, followed by Patrick and Paula. All right, so I think one of the things I would like to see the field do better or that people can, I guess, work on is um, unpacking the meaning of different things when we talk about diversity and inclusion. So instead of just leaving diversity out there and assuming that people like, you know, know what that means, are you talking about gender diversity, racial diversity, like what, what, what type of diversity is being discussed? Um, I think another thing that, that's in the field is there's a lot of confusion on the value of diversity and inclusion work. Uh, so in certain places, it's like it's highly regarded, but in other, you know, but as far as like in relation to tenure and things that some people say really matter, quote unquote, <laughs> um, it doesn't boost you or it doesn't necessarily hurt you if you don't, not even if you don't do it, but even if you are offend, like offending other people, your position, your privilege, your power is not reduced. So some people are like, is this a sensory thing or is it secondary? And then another thing I've noticed in the research is that few times I've actually seen what people believe diversity will help do. Um, so it's just assumed meaning that you know diversity is better. If we get people around, it'll be better. It's all be better. We'll be more competitive. We'll get better ideas. And not actually talking about in what ways will that happen. Not actually talking about what needs to happen when diverse people are around um, to make it an inclusive environment, an inclusive setting. And along those same lines, one of the things I think uh, can translate research findings into inclusive classroom practices is if instructors and research researchers make it both a pro professional and a personal priority. Um, I think you know how do you exemplify an inclusive mentality in your personal life as well as in your practice? So not just when you're doing research groups or you're on that diversity team, but when you're in everyday life, what does your social group look like? What type of, uh, what news do you, you know, what type of things are you into? What do your hobbies look like? And are you around other people? Because it's very hard to sort of just turn it on in a, in a practitioner, as a practitioner in the professional space when you haven't developed those skills in your personal life. And so I think what's very key is developing uh, intercultural competence. Um, and, 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 you know, so a lot of things that we're talking about is understanding how to identify different cultures, how to shift cultural perspectives 
um, how to empathize and not just sympathize, how to discern between respect and tolerance. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. Patrick? Yes, this area of uh, research, one example as we were preparing uh, that came up was uh, thinking about engineering or STEM areas and teams. So physics lab, you would be in a team. Uh, chemistry lab, there'd be a group. Our engineering classes, specific, specifically our freshman engineering classes, we put the students in uh, teams. Paula was one of our students in a particular team. And there was the example of uh, literature that speaks of, well, you have self-selection of teams, especially uh, involving females, or if you were to say, I'm going to put one female on every team, would that be insulting? Would that be pulling uh, the females aside? So when we translate that into the classroom, it, it is back to, we said, inclusivity. Uh, we have to be a little more intentional. And we have to give some choice, some options. So it's not all the time uh, there's a female on every team. It's not all the time uh, that we don't create some diversity. One example was we also have a all-girls uh, Grand Prix team here at IUPUI. So that's an area where there is some synergy for that female connection versus in the classroom, we're not going to say that every uh, group of females have to come together for a team. So I think that uh, inclusivity item is we have to keep a balance and really monitor how we do that in the classroom because there's some uh, particular differences that come up. Paula? Um. As I mentioned, I'm part of the biomedical engineering department here at IUPUI, and in my program, we are about 50 women, 50 men. So I personally think that my professors uh, work really well in how to create teams. Um, as Dr. G said, um, they try to put as many men and as many women in the group. Most of the time, they assign group to us. So it's not, um, it's not showing all oh, just guys in the team or just the best students in one team and then other people, uh, whatever, and stuff. Um, so I personally think that my professors um, really think about uh, make sure everyone is included in the group. Um, it, there is diversity. It's not just like, oh, the international students in one group and then the other people in the other one. No, they make sure also that they create groups depending on the talent and how well students do in the class so they can help each other. Um, so that's in my area of classroom. Um, now in my area of my research um, group, my job, um, there is just two girls in my group, including me, and around 10 guys um, in the group. And I personally think that is not a bias of my mentor. It's not like he likes to have men in the group. It's just like the way that um, these students have approached him to be part of his lab group uh, and the same way as I approach him to be part of the lab group. So um, I don't feel excluded. I don't feel that um, I know less than these students. Actually, I know, I'm, I feel like my talent is improving their talent and also I'm learning from them. So um, it's a lot to what, how you want to feel in the group. Like, do you really feel that you belong to? Because that's how you want to think, or like, do you really feel like your coworkers feel less about you because of being a woman or of being um, from another country or another culture? Um, but I personally think that I feel included in all of my aspects in the classroom, in my lab research. Um, it's a good point that James said that why are you surrounded by? Um, I personally feel that the fact that I'm an international student, I like to also um, interact with people from different countries. And now that, was, that he said that, I also have a lot of friends from other countries. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very important your daily life, 
how it is and how you project that in your work space. Thank you, James, Patrick, and Paula for sharing um, all those strategies. Um, Alison had talked about moving away from the Choctaw lecture and using more culturally resp or relevant responsive pedagogies, and James had also vocalized that. So group work is definitely a great way to move away from lecture, but then when you do group work, you have to do it well. And we've heard Patrick and Paula and James talk about very specific strategies on how, you, how would you want your students to feel included in the group, part of the group? How can you create a group composition that supports inclusivity? And we've heard some, uh, some wonderful suggestions here on the whiteboard. So just to quickly wrap up this uh, particular question, avoid using gendered um, languages. A gender language, um, knowing your pronouns, uh, what preferred pronouns, that, what pronouns that your students would like to be um, addressed with. Uh, this strategy on uh, breaking the bias habit and actually talking about implicit biases in your classroom on the first day of class. Um, and here is a great suggestion on instructors to address their own identities on the first day of class and acknowledge their positionality. Um, the comment at the bottom here, most faculty fail to translate research findings into inclusive classroom practices, at least at my school. Uh, I'm not even sure what if they know the word. That is a very commonly encountered question. Um, I'm a faculty development professional, and I've encountered that very same issue. So as faculty development professionals or as faculty in terms of how we would interact with our peers to talk about these um, topics is definitely very important. And a couple of great resources have been shared on this slide. We'll make sure to include those in our resources, list of resources, and share that with our participants. We have about four minutes um, to go at this point. So at this point, we'll basically open it up to Q&A. Uh, feel free to raise your hands or write your questions on the chat, chat um, uh, on the whiteboard or the chat box for any of our panelists um, or presenters. We do have a few um, resources that we wanted to share with you, um, and that will be provided with the PowerPoint. I'm just quickly going through the slides. Um, and our next turtle cast will be on uh, inclusive teaching in mathematics and informatics, so please feel free to join us. Uh, but at this point, I'm just going to open it, open it up to Q&A from our uh, participants. Um, so feel free to um, you know, post your questions. Or any takeaway comments, um, suggestions on the on the whiteboard here on the chat box. Uh, you can use the raise hand tool if you would like to um, use it. Do our panelists have any um, last comments or parting thoughts? Well, I, I would say that um, at the beginning, and I wrote this in the chat, but I mentioned as well, uh, the quote by Dr. Pauly referenced um, if we all want to see the representation um, proportion in, in engineering proportionate to society. And I put in there that I don't think, quote, unquote, we all do. And so I also think it's important just to recognize that if this is important to you, it will in many ways be a fight. Like it's not an inevitable thing that will, over the years, we'll get better. Like we've had many years and we're still in the same position. And some argue we've receded. So I think um, that this is important to you you have to be willing to take up the mantle and really advocate and be assertive in uh, you know, communicating the value and things like that. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing that, James. Any other thoughts? We have about a, a minute left, so I would like to thank um, all of our panelists and participants today. This was a, a great discussion, 
and uh, any other additional resources we can share on any of the questions that went unanswered, unfortunately, due to time, we'll definitely do that. Um, but otherwise, we hope that you'll tune in for our um, next sort of cast, which is um, next Thursday. It's going to be on inclusive teaching in the mathematics and informatics disciplines. Otherwise, thank you all for joining us today. Have a wonderful afternoon.